much for filling the front seats. All right. Um, uh, thank you, everybody, for joining us uh, today. Um, Welcome to Mari's first grand seminar. Uh, we This is our very first grand seminar. We hope to be doing this every quarter. And uh, in in our today's seminar, our um, theme is large language models and low resource languages. And we have very, very uh, insightful talks um, ahead, starting with the keynote. And then later on, we'll have a panel discussion. Uh, at this point, I'll just give it, um, I'll just give a moment for Jackie to kind of like give us a, a brief uh, about Mari and um, yeah, please take it away, Jackie. Thanks, Melison. Hi, everyone. So I am delighted to welcome you, both new faces and familiar faces, um, to the, and people online, <laughs> um, to the first Mari Grand Seminar. Um, Mary's a multidisciplinary team. We consist of research, engineering, design, and data science. Um, and our mission is to understand, design, and deploy innovative cloud and AI technologies, um, which address the problems of the world, I guess, um, and help help to make make a more productive society, um, work, and health globally. Um, and obviously, large language models are a really big part of what we've been working on, as everyone in this room knows and in the virtual room knows. You know, recently they've really taken the world by storm in the last few months with the release of ChatGPT and other technologies such as Bing, Chat and Bard. Um, however, when it comes to um, language, it's a really contentious issue when we're thinking about large language models as the vast majority, absolutely really, really, really low <laughs> more like training data is in English than, than in any other languages. Um, and if we want to really democratize AI, that's provide, create AI technologies, which are valuable um, to all sectors of society all around the globe, then we have some serious research to do. Um, we need to think about how can we understand and um, improve the performance of large language models in under-resourced languages. Um, and equally important, how best to in, use these technologies to enhance human life and relationships rather than to, to, to deplete them. We have a whole set of other research questions as well, but those are probably the two that are the most important that we have because they're really going to transform how we interact with technology. And as we all know, that can be for the positive or it can be for the negative. And what we want to build is build a global inclusive society where it's for the positive. Um, so I'm really excited that we can begin to explore some of these questions with you all today. And without further ado, I pass you back to Millicent. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Jackie, for that wonderful intro. Um, I'll go straight to welcoming our keynote speaker all the way from uh, India. Uh, I'll introduce now Dr. Monojit, who is a principal data and applied scientist in Turing, India, where they build uh, large universal language models that form the backbone of various Microsoft products. Prior to this, Morajit was a principal researcher at Microsoft Research Lab India. His research interests cuts across the areas of linguistics, cogni cognition, computation, and society. He has uh, a BTEC and PhD in computer science and engineering and had been at MSR uh, Microsoft Research since 2007. The floor is yours, uh, Dr. Monajit. Thank you, Millicent. Uh, and uh, thanks to Mari for inviting uh, me today for this uh, very first talk uh, in the in your grand seminar series. So it's, it's indeed quite an honor to be the first speak keynote speaker of this series. And I look forward to you know, uh, not only today's sessions, but also the entire series. 
Uh, yeah, so what I'm going to talk about is how we can scale up the large language models across languages. So I'll start with what are the problems and then trying to explain, um, you know, why the performances are unequal across languages and then, uh, you know, what can we do uh, to help uh, improve the performance in languages which are under resourced. So. Just a minute. Yeah, so uh, as Jackie said, lang large language models are taking us by a storm and uh, th there are many ways uh, in which it can be visualized, but I like this particular graph from Chris Potts uh, where um, it's a bunch of uh, benchmarks uh, that uh, or test, uh, you know, uh, data sets that are uh, shown here and how the accuracy in those data sets have improved over the years. And as you can see, as we are approaching 2018, uh, it's almost a vertical line. The moment a data set is proposed, you know, uh, the accuracy shot up and we reach the zero line. The zero red line here is human performance. And in fact, we go beyond the zero line. Okay, so as in like. So uh, beyond the zero line, which is the superhuman performance. So, uh, you know, when, when the uh, essentially what it means is language models are um, getting better at a speed faster than we humans can throw challenges at it. And therefore, many people are saying that probably we have hit AGI, artificial general intelligence, or probably uh, we are soon going to hit uh, technological singularity and all that. So uh, that's, I don't know, like, uh, looks like a positive thing, uh, though. Uh, mm, yeah, and, and another way to look at it is how quickly technology is adopted uh, today and how quickly technology spreads around the world. So uh, many of you would have seen this graph. So uh, chat GPT, when it was launched in five days, it had one million users. But technologies like Instagram and all the way back to if you go to Netflix, it took several years to reach that milestone. And if you go even further back to, you know, telephones and mobile phones, uh, you know, it took decades to reach those kind of numbers. So in some sense, this is a very good news because there is a democratization of AI or technology. So uh, to share an, a personal uh, anecdote, I was visiting my school where I studied. It's a remote corner in the northeast of India. It's a place called Agartala. And I was visiting my school in uh, January 2023, and it was a visit after some five years. Uh, and I, I graduated from my school around 20 years ago. So uh, the uh, principal of the school asked me to talk about uh, to uh, talk to the students, and I asked what topic I should talk about. He said, "Oh, you should talk about AI because everybody is crazy about AI today." And I started uh, talking about AI. I started with Turing test and asked how many of you have heard about Alan Turing? Uh, and I was addressing middle school children. So class grade eight to uh, grade 11. And not a single hand went, I think only one hand went up. And then the next question was, how many uh, of you have heard about chat GPT? Almost all hands went up. So that's uh, uh, that's the power of uh, technology and also, you know, it's great to see because I used computers for the first time in my life um, after moving out of Agartala uh, and after I reached to my college. Although computers have been there for, you know, many, many decades at that time. Uh, so that gap is reducing. So that's a great news. However, not everything is that rosy. So uh, consider these two languages, Dutch and Somali. So both are spoken by um, few, uh, you know, a couple of dozens of millions of speakers. But if you see, you know, the amount of resources and investment that has gone to build technology in these languages. So Dutch has around 69. I mean, this is uh, statistics from 2020, two years ago, three years ago. So 69 resources, uh, which is a healthy count. Uh, whereas Somali in those indices had only two resources. Uh, and uh, then we tried the state of the art translator for both the languages uh, to translate a sentence. The tiger moved across the grass and it did a perfect job of translating the Dutch sentence, but the Somali 
one seems like uh, you know what it ended up translating means beans moved on the grass instead of the tiger moved across the grass so this is i'm talking of uh, 2020 in general if you look at over the years uh, how the uh, field of language processing has progressed uh, for various languages and again comparing dutch and somali so the blue line here is number of dutch papers published in a place called ACL Anthology, which archives uh, most of the top NLP conferences. And uh, the orange line is that for Somali. So you see like the number of papers in uh, Dutch and so essentially the attention that Dutch has received has been growing up significantly over the years. And after 2014, it has peaked quite, uh, you know, steeply. It's going up quite steeply, but that doesn't, uh, that didn't happen with Somali. Um, in general, uh, in, in this particular study, so this is a, a 2020 ACL paper uh, which uh, um, we had on, uh, you know, state and fate of linguistic diversity and inclusion in our conferences. And um, I'm, I'm uh, showing this graph from there. So essentially, uh, we did the same thing for all conferences under uh, ACL. And uh, here I'm not showing any particular language, but here I'm showing how many languages are mentioned. But it's a, uh, it, it kind of shows, uh, you know, the higher the value, the more languages are mentioned and it's not a skewed distribution. So a language mentioned once is not counted, like it has to be a, mm, a kind of, a, mm, you know, sufficient number of times each language has to be mentioned. So uh, if we look at that, you see uh, two patterns. One is a positive pattern that for most of these languages, uh, sorry, most of these conferences, there is an upward trend in number of languages that we are including uh, over the time. But the number itself is very low. You know, uh, to give you a feel of it, four here means on average two to the power four, which is 16 languages are being worked on. So 16 out of 6,000 languages that exist in the world. And uh, two interesting trends that we note are, uh, you know, uh, if, if you see uh, since when things have started getting better, you see that around 2015-ish, uh, you know, in most conferences, we start seeing more papers uh, that are multilingual, talk of languages other than English or Dutch or Spanish and Chinese. So uh, th th indeed, this is a positive trend. I will share one more example of the same. Uh, trend. Uh, so this is a recent work that uh, you know I did with uh, the large Masakhane team led by um, Muhammad, and uh, we created data set for uh, you know sentiment uh, annotated corpora for four Nigerian languages: Hausa, Igbo, Yoruba, and uh, Pidgin. And uh, what I want to point you to: this was 2022, 20, uh, but what I uh, in, in this table, we tried to list all the work that existed in this language. And except for one paper, which was published in 2012, and this was a data set of Yoruba, most of the other things happened in 2019 onwards. So, which is, a, of course, a great positive trend, but uh, we are seeing a lot of focus on multilingual, you know, NLP, uh, you know, especially in Africa, starting from 2018, 2019 onwards. So an interesting question to ask is why, uh, you know, what, what could explain this sudden interest? And, um, you know, no price for grazing it, it's deep learning and more specifically LLMs. But one particular thing that LLMs brought in 2018, so this is about the massively multilingual zero shot learning. So until that time, what used to happen is I want to build a system for a particular language. I build data for that language. I build uh, I start with the corpus, then I annotate the corpus with the task specific information. So for instance, if it is sentiment, then I say whether it's positive or negative sentiment, I build that corpus, then I train a model for my language, let's say Yoruba, uh, with that data. Now that's a painstaking process and doing it for 6,000 languages of the world takes a lot of time, a lot of resources and energy. So, uh, and, and many people, I mean, there was not enough resources to be invested, I think, and, and the economy itself skews a thing uh, a lot. The market, basically, the market forces skew things a lot. Uh, however, uh, with multilingual zero-shot learning, what we had was we had this massive model 
which was trained with just raw text corpus from a bunch of languages. So let's say English, Hindi, French, Swahili, Yoruba, Japanese, everything you throw in, you train a model. And now suppose you have only English data to kind of English data on sentiment to fine tune it. So you just fine tune it with English and ideally it should work for English, but then magically it starts working for all the other languages. So that's why zero shot because we did not use any data for you know training for those particular languages. R remember that the training data here or, or the process is called pre-training. So the data here is all unlabeled. So just simple Wikipedia pages or web pages crawled from all over the web. So it, it requires much less effort to do this uh, compared to annotating a data with sentiment. For, for a particular language. So this was a great, you know, uh, jump, almost a leap. Um, and uh, the benefit, like I said, now I need only unlabeled data in a language to build a model for that language. I need labeled data only in some high resource languages, and then I can fine tune and it will work for all languages. So that's why people got very excited that their language can also now have technology. And that's why we started creating all these kinds of data sets to see, you know, first even to measure how will these multilingual models work for my language and after that, um, you know, how to make it better. But unfortunately, uh, the story is, as soon as we started digging it up a little bit more turned out to be a little more complex than that. So first, is uh, you know not all languages have enough unlabeled data to build good pre-trained models. So in this uh, particular graph, uh, what uh, I'm showing is on the x-axis we have unlabeled data available in these languages uh, in various languages. Y-axis is the labeled data, and each dot is a language. No price for guessing what is this language. Of course, English, which has the highest amount of data in all axes, but uh, Note that the, both the scales are logarithmic. What it means is when you come from English to this next bunch of languages, it's an order of magnitude less data, both labeled and unlabeled. And when you go here, it's another order of magnitude less data, right? And uh, we looking at this plot, we said, okay, languages can be divided probably in these six classes. So class zero are the languages which has no labeled data, no unlabeled data. So obviously no technology can help them uh, we need to start things from scratch. Uh, languages which are in five and four definitely have everything and can be uh, we can build good systems for them. Three is the set of languages where we don't have labeled data. So earlier technologies didn't help, but now with the promise of massively multilingual models, we can probably build good models for these languages because they have high amount of unlabeled data. So we can build, you know, a uh, good pre-trained model for them. So these are the set of languages which are benefited by technology and we call these languages the rising stars. Uh, but uh, class one and two also had a fairly weak representation in these large language models because they have less unlabeled data. So let's see how many languages and what language, how many speakers are there in each of these right cases. So in the highest resourced case, class five, there are only seven languages spoken by 2.5 billion speakers. That's 0.28% of all the languages represented in the previous plot. In class zero, there are 2000 plus languages, 1.2 billion speakers, 88% uh, of the languages. So 88% or more of the world's languages spoken by 1.2 people, a billion people are completely bereft of any kind of benefits that language technology has to offer. So this is a huge number. Think about it for a moment. No. And of course, we have reached these 1.8 plus 2.2 plus 2.5 billion speakers, but the remaining set, you know, which is together probably around 1.3, 1.4 billion speakers, we are completely missing out on. Okay. And there are lots of, I mean, you all know there are lots of African languages, uh, Indian languages, which are, I mean, languages from the global south, which are there in this 1.2 billion. And many of them are spoken by millions of speakers. Somali being one example I showed. In fact, I think the only um, African language that appear in, uh, there is no African language in class five and class four. There is only Afrikaans uh, and probably Swahili in class three. And all other languages are two, one and zero. So we, we need a lot of work to be done here. There is yet another problem. 
Now, uh, while multilingual zero shot learning works, but it does not work equally well across different languages. So very early, you know, research 2019 was when it was uh, kind of introduced by 2020 people knew this because um, you know as shown in this graph so the star uh, this uh, I think this plus is the English performance in each of these cases which has the highest performance because English was where the data was for all the other languages it was a zero shot but none of them reached close to English and in fact some of them for some of the these are different tasks for some of the tasks were quite poor the accuracy was really low so something to keep in mind again so, you know, all languages are not equal when it comes to zero shot learning. And by the way, we are talking of 100 languages which are supported by BERT out of 6000 languages in the world. Uh, th that's also another thing to be kept in mind. Now, somebody might argue that, well, this was 2020 and you yourself said the world is changing at a fast pace. Now there is chat GPT and even better models GPT-4. What about them? So very recently, my colleagues from MSR, Sunena and Kalika, both of them are here. In fact, Sunena is going to speak uh, uh, part of the next panel. So they did a very interesting study. So they tried to see how a chat GPT's performance. Uh, so that's GPT 3.5 plus RLHF. So that's chat GPT's performance on a bunch of multilingual tasks. Turns out that actually it's worse, worse than some of the previous generation multilingual models. So uh, we, uh, in fact, we are not improving the uh, fairness or distribution of performance across languages uh, by introducing these larger and smarter models. So what can we do then? Um, I will uh, try to argue that there are three steps that we can follow systematically. The first thing is to understand where we even stand for each and every language. So essentially evaluate carefully for each language. Then second is once we have evaluated and understood how you know the accuracy varies from language to language, trying to ask why the accuracy varies, right? And explain what brings out this difference. And if we understand what brings out this difference, we can probably bridge the differences in a more strategic way. So, and this brings to the third point that we can we have to strategize you know supporting 6000 languages of the world at the same level of accuracy uh, or performance is never going to happen but what can we best strategize given the um, you know limited resources that we have how can we be more and more inclusive with the languages of the world so that's how i have divided the rest of my talk so let's start with uh, you know uh, the evaluation part and actually most of the part at uh, rest of the talk will be on this because the others will very easily follow from what we see from evaluation. So first problem when you start evaluating languages, uh, I mean across languages is that there are no data sets. Like I told you the Nigeria, uh, you know, data sets for Yoruba or Hausa were just created in 2022 and there are many, many more languages and that was only for sentiment. If you want to, you know, measure uh, let's say Yoruba accuracy for hate speech recognition, you may not have any data. So uh, similarly, if you have very complex problems, you may not have any data for even languages like Swahili, which is relatively resource rich uh, if you compare the rest of the languages from Africa. And uh, this graph shows how the uh, you know test sets are distributed and there is a huge skew there are only 60, 70 languages listed here, and that too many of them have only one or two data sets, which is not enough. Uh, so when we claim, make these tall claims that we have a multilingual model which works for hundreds of languages, it's like we have tested it for only you know two or three languages and uh, claiming that. So an, an analogy I like to give is as if you, we have built a medicine which works for uh, humans and ma uh, you know whales and we claim that it works for all mammals right no doctor on earth will do that so why we as technologists make such claim so uh, three years ago um, when i was at msr so with my colleagues uh, sunena kalika and and bunch of colleagues from um, uh, microsoft development center we embarked on a project where uh, we tried to build a model which could predict the accuracy of a, uh, of a fine-tuned model 
uh, on a on a unseen language. So something like this that I have this multilingual uh, pre-trained model that I have trained. I have seen its accuracy in five different languages. Can I predict based on that observation? Can I predict its accuracy on the sixth language for which I haven't tested it? Looks like an impossible task, but I will show you how you can formulate it as a doable thing. And if this is doable, if we can do it with a reasonable accuracy, then there are two, uh, you know, several great things that come out of it. One is, of course, you can, you know, uh, even without test data, get some idea of what the expected performance is in a large number of languages. But, you know, it also tells you, you know, when you are training the machine learning model, it will kind of learn which factors kind of give what kind of, you know, how these different factors or features that we include in the learning algorithm, how it influenced the accuracy. So if we can understand this, we can exploit those ideas to do better cross-lingual transfer. So that's one byproduct of it. The second is, you know, if I have such a function which tells me the accuracy, I can also hypothetically pose this question that suppose, you know, I had the X amount of data in language A and Y amount of data in language B, what will be my accuracy? Even though language A and language B don't have X and Y amount of data because they are low resource language. But because I can predict that now, if I have a limited budget, I can, based on that hypothetical prediction, I can try to optimize that how best I can utilize my limited amount of budget to collect data in various languages to maximize the performance. So these are the two benefits and the project that uh, we, uh, in, under which we did it, we call it Litmus. So linguistically informed testing of multilingual systems. I don't have time to get into the technical details of it, but I'll give you the uh, brief idea of what we do. Uh, and then I will show you a quick, uh, some screenshots of a demo that you can go and play with, uh, uh, you know, because it's available online. So uh, the way we formulate it is, suppose we have a task, uh, a, we have a model, so models could be any of these. Um, we have a bunch of languages on which we can collect some data or have some data uh, and a bunch of target languages on which we want to predict the accuracy. So imagine that I have, you know, mm, these are called fine tuning configurations. So in L1, I have these many examples, L2, I have these many examples and so on. So each row gives a different fine tuning configuration for this. I have observed performance on these target languages. So mm, one question I can ask therefore is new configurations, which are hypothetical. So for instance, this was a low resource language. Now I'm putting this value to 100. I don't have 100 data points, but hypothetically I can ask this question. And you know, can I answer what is the accuracies that I expect? And as you can imagine, this is a regression problem. Uh, and uh, if I have enough of this kind of data, I can probably answer these kind of questions. But then, what will be more interesting is, uh, you know, what if I had a new set of new language on which I don't have any observation? Can I still predict it? So this is a hard problem. It's not clear. Can we do it? But in, if we want to do it, then we have to represent languages by certain features and instead of the language name itself. And then probably based on the features and correlation between features, the model can learn something. Of course, you can make this problem a little more solvable when you add data from multiple tasks. This is just a strategy to increase the number of uh, data points on which the model can learn. And, and also it reduces the noise that might be there with a particular data set uh, for a task. OK, so uh, what's uh, uh, I mean, we learned a regression model, but uh, what is interesting is what are the kind of features that we used to learn? We used a whole bunch of features. I'll show you only four or five here, which eventually turned out to be interesting and important. So one is subword overlap. So if I have two languages, uh, one, uh, the pivot language, in, in my example, it was English, in which I have labeled data, and one, the you know target language where I'm measuring my accuracy. Uh, so if I can count how many tokens are similar between these two languages, how many subwords are similar between these two languages, then uh, as you can imagine, higher the overlap, probably I will get better accuracy. Um, because there will be a better transfer. The, um, uh, you know, 
Uh, intuitive uh, idea is uh, I can transfer from English to German better than English to Swahili because uh, English and German share a lot of words. Similarly, uh, there are other linguistic things like I can also measure syntactic distance, phonological distance, you know, a geographical distance between languages. There are data sets uh, like World Atlas of Languages which stores syntactic properties, phonological properties of various languages, and we can compute these distances from there. Then uh, another important thing is pre-training size, how much pre-training data I used in the original uh, pre-trained model, like let's say MBERT while I, uh, for, for a particular target language. As you can imagine, lower the amount of pre-training data, poorer the performance. Uh, and uh, finally, the tokenizer quality. So those of you who are aware of it, uh, these tokenizers are actually statistical in nature. So you'd give the corpus and there is an algorithm which tries to automatically break down words into uh, sub words, which are called tokens. Now, uh, what happens sometimes is this to uh, because it's a statistical thing. If you have a lot of data in a language, you will learn a better tokenizer for that language. If there is less data, you will learn a poorer tokenizer. So I will show you a very concrete example of how the tokenizer quality very strongly affects the performance. But uh, uh, you know, before that, uh, using all these kinds of features, we trained a variety of regression algorithms, and we showed that you know certain kind of uh, Gaussian process regression for multilingual data works pretty well. For known languages, like seen languages, in a hypothetical situation, it can give you a prediction which is as good as within one percent of the actual value. For unknown languages, um, new languages, it can give you a uh, value which is within 5%. So both are great guesses, uh, I would say, like even 5% for a new language is, is a great predictive, uh, has, has a lot of use. So as I said, uh, these are all available, both the tool and the code are available. You can play with the, uh, you know, litmus predictor uh, online. You can, I mean, uh, you can also, in fact, upload your own models and train your own predictors there. So you can select the model, you can select various configuration, like how much data in what language and run it. And it will give you like, okay, in your target language French for this particular configuration, this is the expected accuracy and so on. It will also say, okay, these predictions are within 0.4% error bounds. And then what you can do is there are these budget settings. So you can say, oh, now I have these extra, you know, 10,000 annotations that I can put in. 8,000 here shown, 8,000 annotations that I can collect, which language I should collect if I want to increase the performance in this particular language or increase the average performance in these five languages. And using mm, the optimization, I mean the same predictive function and running it as an optimizer, it, it will give you a prediction. So we did it in Bing actually for certain kind of, um, you know, uh, offensive content prediction uh, and it reduced the data requirement by 10 times. With 10 times less data in some languages, we achieve the same performance because of this. So it, it, it is pretty useful in that sense. Now, let me come to uh, you know, the more interesting part, which is trying to explain uh, what's happening, uh, why the performance varies. Now, uh, in, in this table, these are the tasks, but what, uh, and these are the features on uh, each column. The value here is called a sharp value. Higher the value means stronger the influence. And what you can see is this particular thing, PCW, which is a tokenizer quality measurement, that has the strongest, you know, uh, prediction on accuracy. So, what in in other words, if you have a bad tokenizer, you are going to get really pathetic performance for for a particular language. Now, uh, what are the other things? The other thing is the geo geographical distance between the pivot language and the target language. I already told you. So English and German not only are mm, be, do belong to same family, but they are also close to each other. So because of that, they have a lot of shared vocabulary and uh, shared grammar, etc. So if you are using English as pivot, you can transfer very well to German, maybe also to French. But it will be very difficult for, to transfer well from English to Hindi or English to Swahili. If you want to transfer well to, let's say, um, Kenya Rwanda, you might want, uh, uh, and you are doing from English, you will get a very poor result. But if you had data in Swahili, you could actually do a much better job for Kenya Rwanda. So uh, th th these are some of the things to keep in mind. 
And the other thing is subword overlap. So subword overlap, like I said, you know, if two languages have a lot of common things, common words, then they help each other. Um, Pre-training size, of course, is important, but interestingly, it's not the most important thing here. So one would probably think the pre-training size data set size is the most important thing, but you can also get away with fewer amount of data if there are other languages which, sub, which are similar to this language and has large data. Um, so let me give you a concrete example. And since we are talking in Kenya, and this is an example of Swahili, so I, I really love this. So uh, how tokenizer impacts uh, the accuracy. So if you see, so there's a task called NLI, um, natural language inferencing, where given a premise and a hypothesis, uh, you have to say if the hypothesis is true uh, or false based on the premise. Um, and uh, there are these uh, data sets in a bunch of languages. And if you try to do zero shot from English to these languages, so English is the pivot here, and you want to do zero shot for all these languages. So accuracy in Swahili is low, but it's not very low. Like accuracy in Swahili is as low as accuracy in Hindi and so on. Uh, however, for a specific class of examples, this is what we were looking at in this study. So we looked at cases where negation is important to understand the relationship between the hypothesis and premise. So for instance, if I say, uh, you know, uh, it's raining outside uh, is my premise and hypothesis is the grass is not wet. To make the inference, I have to understand that it has been negated, so I have to understand not. So those kind of examples. So if we just look at those kind of examples and see how much is the accuracy drop compared to English in other languages, in all other languages, it's like between one to 5%. This is Hindi, this is Urdu, Russian, French, Spanish, Arabic. This uh, Arabic is very different from English. Hindi is very different, but still it's not a huge drop. Swahili, there was a 23 points drop, especially for this class of examples. So we are puzzled why it's happening for Swahili. And turns out when we tried to look at negation, uh, you know, structure of negative sentences in Swahili, that in Swahili, unlike all these other languages, there is not a negation word like no or not kind of a word or, or the, which we call particle in linguistics. But instead, there is a prefix which is a negation marker, and this is the prefix varies from as uh, as the person and the number of the subject varies. So if you want to say I'm not singing, it will be Simbi. I mean, you guys know, <laughs> many of you know a lot more than me here uh, about Swahili, but but uh, yeah. Uh, and and it's, it's not unique to Swahili, by the way. Many languages have this kind of negation typology or negation patterns. And what has happened is in such cases, unless the tokenizer learns it to break at C and DIMBI, Hatu and DIMBI, it will never be able to predict, uh, you know, negation well or understand negation well for Swahili. And this is what was happening. So uh, there is a strong, you know, case for building very good tokenizers. And there is also a strong case for, you know, understanding typology of various languages and where they differ, because you can't just make a blanket statement that it, it will work for all languages, because I have seen that in some languages it does work. So now, um coming to you know understanding then what affects performance i already spoke about now specifically how we can exploit some of this right so one idea is of course i already said better tokenizer for low resource languages is something we can work on second is better pivot languages so this is very important i think so suppose you want to you know improve the quality of uh, performance in all the kenyan languages maybe you can create a lot of data in swahili or if you want to increase the performance in all South African languages, you can build a good set in Zulu. So uh, that that's one uh, you know important thing. So and and why this is important is since we cannot make data in all languages, this might be like as I will talk about when I talk about strategy. This might be a good strategy. You know, identify languages from each geographical region and try to build resources in those more. So, so that because of zero shot transfer, you get better results in related language. Another thing which people might, I, I don't know of any work here, but I think might be very interesting to try 
is uh, there is this notion of um, uh, idea of RLHF reinforcement learning with human feedback that really improves the performance of generative LLMs. So can we use this for low resource language and what will be the best way of using them? So that that's a good research area, um, I think. Um, then uh, there, there is this other uh, idea which people use where you know you can make a dedicated language model for uh, a bunch of uh, languages. So instead of collecting, uh, taking data from all languages uh, and make a model for 100 language like Ember, you might take data from all the, you know, Kenyan languages and make a dedicated model. Like Afribart is one example which takes African languages. So that also helps. And another thing which people can do for making better tokenizers is sometimes when the script of the languages vary, you might transliterate the input to a common script because the uh, these languages might share words, but uh, these words might look different because of the different script. So this is the case for Indian languages. All Indian languages have their own script, but you know they share a lot of vocabulary. So if you can all transliterate them into a common you know script and then tokenize, then you get better results. So these are some of the tricks that can be done for low resource languages. Now this brings me to the last part of the talk, which is uh, how can we then strategize? Uh, I will come to uh, a global, global strategy for language scaling towards the end, but before that, I want to talk about uh, you know something very important, which I think uh, we all tend to miss uh, when we do this, you know, this kind of uh, research in multilingual uh, modeling, which is that you know. If you look at any leaderboard uh, today, what it will show you is uh, it will show you a model. And somebody would have measured it for a bunch of languages where data was available. So let's say all these languages where data was available for a particular task. And then what it will show you is this average score, right? Is this average score? And now if you look at the average score, the natural winner, I mean, who is the winner here, right? Of these four models, who is the winner? And somebody will say XLMR is the winner because it gets 72.6, which is the highest average. So this is the very common practice. Nobody even questions it. So in one of our work in 2021, we questioned this very notion of averaging. In fact, you know, average is one of the worst metrics that you can choose in terms of fairness because average varies a lot by, you know, so uh, uh, by the extreme values. So so what it might happen is essentially you see a model is getting better. You think a multilingual model is better, but essentially it's making only English and Chinese better. And actually it is making other languages worse. In fact, in, in this case, you know, XLMR uh, has uh, uh, XLMR has a performance of uh, you know 15.9% for Afrikaans. So uh, sorry, Japanese, Japanese. So which is uh, uh, very bad, right? So uh, if you see all the other models, none of the other numbers are that low. So in some sense, XLMR is the best model, but also the most unfair model if you consider uh, things across languages. So economists study these problems a lot. These are called, uh, you know, social choice theory or principles of distributive justice. It's like uh, given a policy. In in this case, the policy is nothing but a model, and a set of utilities. Utilities are, uh, let's say, the accuracy of the policy, uh, accuracy of the model. In this case, for the recipients. So the recipients are languages. So I make a policy. There are a bunch of people out there. Each of them will have a different utility for them. Some will lose, some will gain. Now, how do I make sure what is the fairest policy here? So economists study uh, these kind of things a lot, and one of the thing that really, you know, um, kind of, uh, I would say, is preferred is that of what we call the Rawlsian or prioritarian choice. What it says is choose the model in, in this context. What it says is choose the model which gives maximum performance for the language which has minimum accuracy. So in this case, if you look at the minimum of each of the rows, the minimum for MMT is 43.1 for Thai. All the other values for this MMT is higher. So it will choose MMT over XLMR because for XLMR it is 15.9. You can convince yourself for all the other languages, the minimum is less than 43.1. Uh, or less than or equal to 43.1. Yeah. So 
now the interesting thing is in terms of average you don't lose much 72.6 to 72.3 so you are not losing actually average accuracy much but you are improving right see mmt is giving 48.6 percent for japanese so mmt is much fairer but also a very high performing model so this is what we propose that first thing we should change is not how we train our model but how we select the best model after training because if you change that selection criteria you know xlmr would have been thrown away in favor of mmt and research would build on top of mmt and um, economists have shown that if you apply this rolsian you know criteria again and again and again the minimum will progressively go up and up and up and eventually you will have a world which is very fair everybody will have very high accuracy so this is one uh, global strategy I think we as scientists and technologists all over the world should adopt. And there are some other interesting things that we can do too. So given that we have finite budget, uh, we can actually try to prioritize the data collection in uh, some languages. So one is I already said how to cover different geographies. So in yet another work uh, that we did where we tried to measure if there was a pandemic and we have to build a bot quickly in the local language in that area for dissemination of information. How ready we are, how prepared we are. We did a bunch of study and at the end we came up with this graph uh, of uh, this map essentially which says red is we are very, very underprepared. So for languages that are spoken by most people in this areas of the world, we really cannot provide a good uh, you know, chatbot solution. Uh, and as you can see, you know, uh, Global South, especially like all of South Asia is pe pretty poorly represented uh, parts of South America and even, you know, um, entire uh, Sub-Saharan, a uh, lot of Sub-Saharan and Eastern Africa. So these parts are green because Arabic is a Arabic or English is a major language understood here and we can build good bots in Arabic. So that's why they are covered but uh, many of these places and even the places like here are not covered. So one thing we should do is select languages, at least one mm, language which can be a bridge language for this area, at least one language which can be bridge area and prioritize data collection for that. If we can do for more languages, that's great, but at least one. Similarly, we want to cover typology. Like I already said, different languages negate differently. You know, different languages have different word orders and so on. So um, we should try to cover, you know, all kind of typologies to make sure that we are not missing out an entire class of languages on which the accuracy is very low. We, we also want to cover all scripts. Uh, so that should be one, one kind of, uh, you know, some principles that we follow and then you know, label training data can be done, created only for strategically chosen languages, uh, like I described earlier, but unlabeled and test data we need for all languages, because at least we need to test for all languages, right? But even here we could strategically distribute, um, uh, choose a, you know, a slightly high amount of resources, I mean data sets in some language. So let's say uh, uh, I have two languages, Zulu and Kosa, and uh, I, may not be able to collect a lot of test data in Zulu. So I collect a lot of test data in Kosa and um, you know some in Zulu and they can be good proxies of each other because they are very close languages. So this kind of uh, strategies would be very useful, but then we have to collaborate at a global level. Um, so that's all I wanted to share. I want to leave you with this notion that uh, what I talked about is only LLMs, but LLMs is not the world of language technology. There is a lot that can be done uh, without LLMs also. And the most important thing to understand is NLP or language technology is a socio-technical challenge. So there is user, language is a uh, integral part of one's identity and how a user interact in their communities. So unless we understand all these interactions, we won't be able to come up with the right kind of positive interventions that are required in language technology for a certain group of speakers or a certain community and that would require participatory design you know understanding economics understanding you know ethics and uh, you know anthropology and lot of other aspects not only technology so uh, uh, there is a um, you know conference coming up uh, in south africa a small uh, you know 
uh, one minute ad for that uh, compass uh, 2023 which is on computing and sustainable society we are trying to do a lot of things around african languages so if you are interested please check the website and please submit um, your work with that uh, thank you oh. Thank you very, very much, uh, Dr. Monojit, for quite an enlightening talk. Uh, this was really great. I enjoyed uh, the talk, and I believe everybody else. Do we have questions for Monojit? We can take a few questions before we move to the next session. Okay. I see a lot of things on the chat. I won't have time to read them all out, but yeah. I'll yes, read them later. yes, we, we, okay, uh, we had questions, but Sunayana tried to answer, uh, Kabir has answered as well. Um, I'm not sure if, uh, Clement, you might want to unmute and ask one specific, one, two specific questions. Uh, hi, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Yeah, maybe I can ask a question that was not answered. Uh, you mentioned that uh, the prediction you made from the litmus uh, environment allowed you to reduce the data requirements uh, in the data collection for Bing. So I was just curious to understand how that uh, experiment was carried out and, um, and how you ensure that uh, the outcomes that you observed are repeatable uh, and so what I was wondering is whether you have like separate teams collect data and one was informed by litmus and then you compared the results or whether you, you compared with previous uh, observations or some other process that you used. Yeah, no, great question actually. So uh, I, I'll first tell you what we did and then I will try to answer the scientific uh, reproducibility part of the question. So uh, we have this, uh, let's say offensive speech uh, or offensive text detectors. And uh, these were trained for data in three languages, um, German, Spanish, and English. And we were measuring it on some 20, 25 languages. So our target languages were, um, let's say many, which also included languages like Finnish, Norwegian, Swedish, and so on. And many of those languages had very low accuracy, especially Finnish, Norwegian and all. So what uh, the people were doing at that time was pumping in more English and Spanish and sorry, English and uh, yeah, English, Spanish and French, or uh, I think there was also German. So they were pumping in more of that data. The reason was that there was a pipeline already set using which we could collect those data and we were trying to do that. Uh, so when we present, I mean, we used litmus on, on that configuration, it showed that actually you don't need any, I mean, to get to that level of accuracy uh, using uh, in, in let's say Finnish. So if I want to increase the accuracy in Finnish by 5%, the amount of English data that you need to pump in is 100,000 examples, whereas you just need maybe, you know, 10,000, uh, you know, Finnish examples or even less, maybe 1000 Finnish examples and you'll get that. And then we, uh, you know, when it was predicted, then we eventually got the Finnish uh, examples annotated and did it and it did way better than the previous method. Now, this kind of sounds a little foolish, like why would somebody do this? But, you know, in large companies, mm, uh, there are lots of constraints uh, and there are lots of, you know, set methods and processes which people follow. But the interesting thing is, um, uh, one strong baseline that you can think about is what if I uh, I had uh, a budget of, let's say, 10,000 examples that I could annotate. I have 10 languages. What if I just collect 1,000 in each? Will not it just optimize? And what we showed is that will not uh, give you the mm, optimal solution. So over that you know equal split uh, approach, uh, you still have a benefit if you use litmus, and that benefit is substantial. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Clement, you have another question? I think the five questions were answered. Oh, great. Thank you. 
yeah so at this point i guess if we don't have any more questions we'll have uh, about um uh, five minutes break and then we'll um come back for a panel discussion which is going to be really great because we are going to have four experts in the field uh, discussing more about large language models and low resource languages. So please stay tuned, don't drop off the call. <laughs> yeah, because it's going to be quite an exciting talk. So I think just five minutes to digest Monajit's talk. And I think we'll take that time to prepare for the next session, like Prof, you'll move forward. All right, thank you very much, everybody. Welcome back. I'll hand it over to Mohammed to moderate the panel session. Over to you, Mohammed. Hi, I hope you can all hear me fine. Uh, thank you again to the Mari team for running this and to David, to Edward, and to Sunayana and Monajit for accepting to come and take part in this panel. Um, just for brief introductions, uh, Monajit was uh, already introduced, but I should, again, say how much of a fantastic uh, researcher and collaborator that he is, and I've benefited a lot from him in this whole time that I've known him and interacted with him. Um, he's a Principal data scientist at Turin, India, where they build a lot of the large model language models that you interact with um, when you use Microsoft products. Um, David is also a longtime friend who is a colleague at uh, Masakane. Uh, David at the moment is a deep mind academic fellow at the Department of Computer Science, University College London. He's a senior, he, he's written a member, but he's not a member of uh, Masakane. He's a senior and a prolific member of Masakane, uh, a grassroots organization whose mission is to strengthen and spur uh, an African language research. Um, so Jan is a fantastic researcher that I've had the pleasure of working with quite a bit recently. She's a senior researcher at uh, Microsoft Research India. Her goals are it is to enable um, inclusive and universal empowerment through technology and add to conquer the world to that as well, given her energy. Um, and David, uh, sorry, and Edward, we've met before, but we've not yet worked together, and I hope to work with you more in the future. Um, Edward is the Dean of the School of uh, Science and Technology in Africa, Nazarene University, and has done a lot of pioneering work in uh, Swahili language um, data collection and data sets preparation and in NLP for Swahili. Um, it's my honor and pleasure to host you all um, in this um, panel. Um, the format will be, I think, we'll have an open discussion on a set of questions. And I think Monajit's talk has already probably raised a lot of thoughts in our minds, um, and uh, we'll hopefully open up the last 15, 20 minutes to the audience to ask questions. Um, I have shared with a, a set of questions, and I tried to sort of organize them in a grouping. And the, the first set is about um, the topic of um, the challenges for developing um, models and language technology, and I'll, and, and I'll use the phrase language technology that Manajit used in order to expand out of um, deep learning models or low resource languages. Um, I'm interested and people are interested in understanding your perspectives on the, uh, on the challenges and how practitioners and communities can collaborate in order to hopefully um, address some of those challenges without biasing the question. Um, I'll open it up and I'll go to, uh, if, does anybody, would anybody like to start to answer that or should I just pick on somebody? I'll, I'll pick on Edward since you're the closest. <laughs> what are your thoughts on the challenges of developing language technologies for um, the resource languages and the challenges and how we might overcome some of those? Yeah, thank you. Um, just speaking from the experience that we had, am I audible? Uh, yes. Oh, great. Yes. Yeah, so I think the number one challenge uh, that cuts across, and that's why they call low resource language, is data. Not just the availability of data, uh, not just the quantity I mean, but also the quality. So data 
as we know, without the data, then it becomes very hard to uh, really train these large language models that rely on massive amounts of data. And therefore, um, looking at some of the works that we've done, uh, specifically on Ken Corpus, Kenya language corpus, uh, we started out by, you know, looking at, and I liked what Chondri said, pivoting on Swahili as our pivot language, and then developing uh, language data sets for two other languages, predominantly spoken in Kenya. So getting this amount of data, you know, at the beginning, it was very hard to find primary data and even secondary data, you know, uh, all these other issues about uh, consent and all that. So number one thing I think I'll go back to its availability, the quantity of data that is available, uh, especially digital and also the quality of this data. So in our case, we actually went ahead and, you know, collected primary data involving communities and, and having that data. But then the other challenge now came, hey, the digital literacy, you know, all this had to be handwritten. And so it was a lot of work trying to do that and uh, getting experts. And we know that experts are very expensive to kind of like now correct all those mistakes because we involved majorly the um, a primary school or, or what we call the K-12, uh, I think largely. Uh, mostly on the primary side and a few in the high school. So apart from getting that data, so the quality of it was an issue also. The handwritten scripts, you know, they were not very legible. So we missed out on a couple of, I think, good collected data, but wasn't useful. So I think for me, that is the number one um, uh, key challenge when it comes to um, applying these large language models on low resource languages. So Nayana, if I could take on you on that, because I know that you're quite opinionated on this subject. <laughs> yes, so uh, I worked on Litmus with Monojit. So, uh, you know, one of the key challenges is in evaluation, um, because we don't end up evaluating all the languages that we are building these systems for, or these systems are supposed to work in. and. You know, Monojit already explained why this is important, but I just want to highlight a couple of things, you know, which happen. So sometimes when we fine tune these models on some languages, they can have unintended side effects on other languages and make the other languages actually worse. Right. And sometimes when you compress these models, also the same thing happens, you know, that some of these languages. So you become you get better at some languages at the cost of others. Right. And because we don't evaluate well and we don't evaluate our languages we don't even know that this is happening a lot of the times so i feel like you know we really don't know where we are um, and you know we've been in the space of around 100 languages or so and even these we are not evaluating well so we have no idea how such systems would work if we um, had more than 100 languages in the model so i think that's one thing like just keeping it real and making sure that we know um, you know how exactly this is going to benefit or hurt all languages in the model. I think that's really important. I also agree about the data quality issue. Um, I think uh, just because there is data on the Internet doesn't mean that it can and should be used. Uh, that data may have uh, issues. It may be you know, toxic hate speech. It, it may have adult content and so on. And the fact that you may not have filters and classifiers that can detect this for those languages that you are now trying to build these you know, first models for can lead to you know, bad quality data getting into the system. And then, you know, that leads to, uh, you know, bad quality models and so on, right? So I think, uh, you know, trying to figure out how we can get or generate high quality data in these low resource languages is also a very big challenge. David, uh, thank, first of all, thank you both for that, because it sparked a lot of thoughts in my mind. And, and David, you and I have had experience in evaluating the quality of data. Uh, um, would, would you care to comment on that? Because that goes yeah, to the heart of both can, evaluation. Mm -hmm. I can comment on that. I think it's very, very important to have high quality evaluation data. So uh, at Masakane, we also try, uh, like tested this. So we had wiki ANN that has been used for, uh, for many years by the scientific community. But the quality is very bad and it's also quite small for most African languages. 
And then we introduce Masakana, which is a high quality, carefully curated data set by our community members and native speakers. And you can see a more realistic evaluation, something that you wouldn't see with Wiki ANN. So that shows uh, that the quality of evaluation data is also important. We do need more uh, like evaluation data set, but it has to be carefully collected. Uh, it doesn't have to be very large, but if the quality is good, you'll still be able to see good quality, uh, like correct patterns that you are looking for. And this can inform you, so it will give you a more positive feedback, not noise, because any feedback you get through Wiki and then you are not sure if this is coming from the way it was automatically collected or uh, the way it was proposed and things like that. So I think this is important just to emphasize um, uh, what other people have been saying. Uh, the quality of the evaluation data is key. And also apart from that, uh, Munojit also said that we also need to prioritize uh, typological diversity of these languages. I'm not sure we can evaluate on all the, on the languages, but if we carefully create uh, like the benchmark data set that cover diverse languages. For example, in southern part of uh, uh, Africa, if I evaluate on the Corsa or Zulu, I can decide to evaluate on Zulu and skip the other. And instead of spending the same budget to create for uh, Corsa, I can pick a more diverse language, as is Somali. And for Somali, I don't need to evaluate for Urumo, maybe, maybe just because they are sometimes similar, and I can decide to pick another language again in West Africa, say Yoruba. So just paying attention to how diverse this language is uh, also can inform how we create benchmark data sets. So even if we have low amount of budget, uh, we'll be still be able to have very uh, good evaluation benchmark. Yeah. Manage it that there, there are two um, points that sort of come out from the points that um, David Edward and Sonyana made, which are um, how do we evaluate and what do we evaluate on? And both of those points uh, go to the heart of sort of uh, data and resource efficiency. Um, which means that we're effectively talking about resources and availability of resources. Would you care to comment on that? Uh, yeah, I, I'll be brief because I have already spoken a lot. Yeah. Uh, uh, so, so I'll just make two points here. Uh, so first of all, I totally agree with everything uh, that all other panelists have said. Uh, one challenge that we have faced while working on low resource languages, especially the ones that we don't speak ourselves, uh, is uh, to get uh, uh, get people who can verify the quality of data, give us the annotations, because you won't get it from Amazon Mechanical Talk or any of the digital platforms. So reaching out, I mean, uh, I, that's why that's what I love about Masakane, because uh, you are working with the people and with the community uh, who speak the language. So I think that's very, very crucial to get high quality data and also to be grounded on what is needed to work with the community who speak the language. If they themselves try come up and build it, great. But if somebody else is, you know, trying to do that, working closely with the community is essential. One point. And second point is, I think it's, uh, I mean, evaluation has gone, uh, uh, I mean, the notion of evaluating models is going to change a lot because uh, LLMs are not reproducible. You know, the, uh, they are stochastic models, so you try it multiple times, you will get different results. I mean, classification problems are fine, but all the generative problems and that's where the world is going on more and more. So I think that's also I mean, it's it's not a low resource problem, but I think it's it's right now even for high resource. This is problem is there, but I think we can make a difference on how the high resource people think when they devise the new evaluation strategy so that low resource languages are not left out. That, that, that's a very interesting point um, because it goes to the heart of um, what's the fidelity of this new technology that we're deploying. Um, but before going there, what there's, there's this related question that's posed there. 
um, which is asked, which was about how can researchers and communities collaborate better um, in order to sort of use language technologies to better serve communities. And I'll pose that question um, initially to uh, Edward, because I know that he's done a lot of work in this space. And then uh, Sunayana and David, uh, if I can open up with you, Edward. Yeah, so just going back to the Ken Coppers project that we started in 2021 and to last year. Um, the first thing that we did in getting this primary data was to do capacity building. So what we did was to, to get a community or the different stakeholders because we worked with um, the publishers, we worked with media, we worked with um, schools and we worked with you know community leaders. So uh, we sampled out and we had these people come at uh, this particular point where doing the training in you know, the locality that was in Kisumu, uh, more central for the Luo and uh, the Luya. And you know, with Luya has several dialects. So we had these people coming over, training them. Um, how do you collect the data, the need for consent? Um, and you know, the dynamics involved when you go to the village and especially around that time, we're approaching a political presidential elections. So when you start coming out, you know, how will this be? Will it be misinterpreted that you're campaigning? So getting their view also, like what's the best approach to collecting this data? So that collaboration was very important. Some of the things that we assumed initially, we found, you know, there was really need uh, to kind of like change strategy in order to get the maximum, um, you know, output from the exercise. So capacity building, then uh, the second thing was also doing that awareness, awareness training. Um, we had a lot of challenges when it came to data collection. Actually, also the data collection itself, it involved the communities. So that was the second part of it, whereby we involved these community leaders who will end up, you know, connecting us and telling us, you know, in the village, you know, we'll hear that um, Mr. X, Y, Z has some data, has been working on some data. So working very closely uh, with these communities in data collection was really, really important. So referrals, you know, from one person to another or the neighboring uh, or the neighbors, in so doing, we're able to collect a lot of data. Now, when it came to I think one big challenge we had was pay for data. Others are saying, hey, why should I give you my data I've been working on for the last maybe two, three years for free? OK, so that was a big challenge. So trying to work together and saying this is a big ecosystem. Trying to train and, you know, that education in that how your data contributes to your community, you know, having this representation of being on, on the Internet, that was a big thing. Uh, and I know the Omuganda project uh, in Rwanda, they experienced the same thing. We had this conversation some time back. So that really was a big, you know, it was an uphill task trying to convince. But then the local leaders, when they bought the idea and they saw how, you know, from the bigger picture, and I know Chaudhry talked about, um, you know, the point of, um, what was it, bounded rationality and trying to see how, what is in it for them? OK, so that has to be very clear as you do data collection. And these particular leaders or the liaison were very, very um, helpful when it came to that uh, data collection point of view. So um, those are the ways that we've seen. And more importantly, when it came to the notation of the data, it's the same people that we used and they were able to refer to other experts uh, within the area. And we worked closely with um, one of the collaborating universities, they have a linguistic department. So they offered expertise uh, in the different languages that we're working on. So that really helped very much working with the local universities within that region, offering expertise. People who actually not just speak the language, but also studying this language, uh, the languages at higher education. Uh, that meant that even that the quality of annotations that we're working on were more reliable, uh, despite, you know, uh, even without using, you know, the scientific method. So having quality people and then eventually again trying to have multiple people doing the notation. So those are the ways that we collaboratively, collaboratively worked with the community 
uh, to be able to uh, collect quality data and quantities in this data. And I think the point that you've made of, or the, the phrase that you used of what's in it for them, goes really to the heart of this uh, question. Um, them being the people that these languages are, uh, that use these languages. And so, yeah. if I pick on you, um, th th this is a conversation and an argument us to have quite often, which is uh, translating is good enough to get a result, but your point being, no, I need the context. Uh, yeah. Would you mind commenting on that? Yes, sure. So, um, you know, one of the shortcuts that um, we take or we have taken in the past when a system doesn't work in a particular language is to just translate whatever you need you know, to be done into English, get the task done in English and then translate back into your target language, right? But the problem with that is that it may miss linguistic and cultural nuances that the translator that get lost in translation. And also, you know, you're not using the uh, the knowledge that is present in the language itself, right? You're basically using the knowledge that is present in English and then translating it back. So that's almost like, you know, language is dying, right? Because uh, you're not using any of the, uh, you know, knowledge that is present in any of those languages and only relying on English. So I feel that that will just uh, sort of, um, you know, create even more of a, digital divide. However, uh, you know, for certain kinds of tasks and queries, etc., that may be fine. You know, that approach may be just fine, but we have to be really careful when we use that kind of approach and make sure that we know what we are doing right when we do that. So I think uh, that's really important. I just want to add one more thing about the community aspect, uh, you know, so uh, at MSRA, we've been working on this project called Elora and Kalika has been leading it. And here we really think that it's super important to work with the community also to figure out what they need so that we can build what they need or you know they can help us build what they really need so whether it is a translation system or whether it's uh, you know something for language learning or uh, you know a dictionary uh, it's really important to figure out what what that language community needs and desires and then uh, build that Having said that, now that we are in this uh, generative AI world, it's uh, really hard to imagine how actually we will continue community engagement with the generative AI models because these models are so huge and they're controlled by, you know, a few corporations now. And so, you know, even if we do collect data, can we do anything with that data? You know, can we actually use that data to improve these models or not? I think those are all big questions that we should be uh, debating at this point. And I um, don't have any answers. <laughs> I, I, we'll expect David to give us the answers um, because I mean, a, a good chunk of Masakani's foundation is um, for us bias. Um, now suddenly uh, the, the the gates are up again with the models. Um, the, the the appearance of hugging face models completely democratized the number of people that had access to state of the art uh, models. Um, and Mr. Kane has gone to great efforts to try to benefit the communities that generate the data. Um, what are your thoughts on the inequities that this now raises, David? And how can we challenge them with, with the sort of communities that we build with Mr. Kane? Yeah, that's a good question. So, so I'm happy about all the effort to democratize, like, yeah, uh, AI. So we have really benefited a lot from tools like Organ Face. Like almost every NLP researcher is using it every day. Uh, so also, I think there are some similarities between what we have been doing at Masakani and what they have been doing. For example, there was this Bloom project, which comprises of a lot of researchers from all over the world to build a single multilingual model uh, to challenge like GPT-3. Uh, I think the performance was quite decent based on the model, but it's also a way to democratize what has been done by these large big tech companies. So the similarity for us is because people are more trying to work more in a participatory way and not just a single lab building a, a new model or a new uh, tool. So people are having cross-institutional collaboration. And this is what we have adopted. And I think it's a good way to continue not only in data set creation, but also in building models. 
if we have been successful doing that with data set collection, we could also do that with uh, this cross institution uh, way of building new models that are specific for African languages. For example, we could try to build our own GPT model. Maybe it's going to be bad. We don't know, but we have more context about our languages. So we, we can evaluate the quality of the data that goes into the model. So if we also do this in a more collaborative and participatory way, uh, with or without guidance of us or other researchers from around the world, we'll be able to produce something useful for African languages. Uh, so I think, yeah, we can learn and also just continue the way we are doing this participatory research. Yeah. That, that, that's that's really interesting. Um, and the, 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 there's a conversation that I've been having recently with quite a few people, um, which is trying to um, compare um, access to language models and large language models to access to search engines. Um, search engine technology is a difficult and expensive technology to build and run, but everybody has access to Bing and Google and so forth because a tiny percentage of users pay for that access. The, the, the profit comes from a small number of users that we advertise to. And so accessibility there is in effect indirect via the cost being lowered because of those users. And, and the points that uh, you guys are making kind of make me think about, are there parallels here? Are there ways in which we can reduce the barriers of access to people in these models? Um, and, and I thought what's your, yeah, what are your comments? Would anybody like to pick up? Mm, yeah, I can uh, speculate. Uh, so mm, I think uh, in the, uh, right now, the cost of these models are prohibitive for even large companies like Microsoft and Google. So in the short run, and I don't know how short is the short run, probably two years, probably five years, uh, most of the applications that we deploy, even for languages like English, are not going to be the large LLM. That's more like there, but uh, we will have distilled models, much smaller models, which will get deployed. In fact, that's what is happening in Microsoft for most cases. You use the large model to generate data and then learn smaller models. Uh, so you can build the smaller models faster because the large you can generate very high quality accurate data using the large model. And the large model are, of course, in Bing you see the large model, but that's the only case where you see it. Um, now, uh, so when the situation is like this, I think uh, we don't have much to, uh, nothing much changes in how, you know, low resource languages with different communities, things will work because uh, I mean, recently we were having this discussion, Sunana and I were in that discussion and somebody said, why can't you generate data using GPT-4 for low resource language and train smaller models? And Sunana and my thing was immediately, no, 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 GPT-4 doesn't work <laughs> that way. You can't generate data or good quality data for these languages. Uh, so, uh, so yeah, so in the short run, I think we are in the same boat. In the long run, and when I say in the long run, I mean the next technology, uh, hardware technology revolution, which either drastically reduces the cost of the hardware or comes up with a new technology like quantum technology, where these models become very affordable. If that happens, then the situation goes back to the hugging face era, because then everybody probably will get access to. But if that doesn't happen, then I think the only thing in between that can happen is um, what has happened in physics. Uh, for instance, um, uh, you know, not even every country can afford to build these large hadron colliders uh, or, or these uh, large particle accelerators. So all together collaborate and build a CERN and then people pay to get access to CERN. And so I think then governments have to step in 
uh, if the companies don't democratize, then governments have to step in and build their own infrastructure for LLMs and prioritize. I mean, I know that's happening in India, for instance. There are 10 or 15 languages chosen, and uh, there's an entire project which tries to be trying to build um, LLMs, and it's a very well-funded project. Uh, so unless that kind of an intervention happens, uh, it's going to be hard because you can't, I mean, everybody can't have their own LLMs or run them. The unfortunately, my my pessimism uh, kicks in, and uh, the pessimistic interpretation is almost as though it, it's what Sunayana said: that uh, gates are going to go up where very few organizations can afford the hundred million dollar bill to be able to train the latest X, Y, and Z, and unless they can see the return directly, the 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 probabilities of offering that up to more organizations and opening up wider become less and less incentivized, which clearly creates issues for academics and universities such as Edward and the communities that we run and participate in, which are not necessarily in the cross sites of big organizations. Um, and I'm and, and curious as how we address those. And I think you're right, honestly, that policy and legislation come to a part of that, um, part of the solution for this. Yeah, no, somehow uh, regulation has to uh, come in, right, from the government and different organizations. I mean, uh, not, not only about the usage of these models, but also uh, we are talking of regulations about RAI, like kinds of usage of these models. Yes where they are allowed and all that. And and um, uh, I uh, I mean, what, what we can try to influence is that language should be one of those axes, mm, you know, linguistic fairness. So when we talk of yes. fairness, linguistic fairness should be one of those axes along which there are strong regulations. That's a very good point. Um, Edward, I'm, I'm curious in, to your interpretations of these points because they go to the heart of um, academia and public institutions having access to these technologies. Yeah, absolutely. Um, looking at the context here in Kenya, you know, I'm just pointing to the need for policy and policy that just ensures that there's inclusivity. Right now, I think it's about, I'm not sure how many years now, but we changed our education system from the initial 844 to now CBC-based, competency-based, and which requires at primary level, a lower primary, the language of instruction includes the predominant language where that school is. And you can mm -hmm. see the effect that is having in the number of publications of um, in the, those local languages. So you can imagine maybe um, even the teachers are allowed to use, for example, uh, Doluo to teach mathematics, and uh, you know Kamba to teach you know uh, English or CRE. So that becomes very very important. And that accessibility, so you can see by the time these children are growing and going to upper primary and to, to you know, uh, high school and to university, how open are we, what policies have been put in place by government or other related agencies to ensure that these tools are progressively built to cater for these communities. They're not just for lower, but then they should be, they should be recognized and uh, usable uh, at all these other levels of education. So that that is a big thing. So policy comes in very handy at that particular moment. And not just policy, because the government will also be tired and saying, hey, where are budgetary, uh, you know, where's the budget line for this kind of, you know, initiative? And that means, you know, not just a budget for the infrastructure, but also for training and capacity building to make sure that the teachers are well trained. So it's not just about, um, about uh, getting a technology and you know just doing automatic translations uh, or using uh, as we said you know let's pick the LMM and mm. you know plant it directly into the community but how sensitive are they to the contextual issues you know around there I think uh, there was an example that was given that translated into beans <laughs> you know uh, and some might be very offensive and that might increase uh, the constraint in the adoption of those technologies 
uh, which again now leads to you know how many how many communities or how many people are using or finding them usable. So that that is really important, and uh, I think David alluded to that. How much are the communities involved, not just in the collection, but also in the evaluation? Okay, in the fine tuning of those models that and that, and generally the language technologies. Um, is this being done in a lab? Sorry to use Microsoft. And are we actually taking them back to those villages where data was collected? Um, and and having them, you know, tell us, hey, is this is this workable? Is this appropriate? Is this really meeting the need on the ground? So these technologies have to be really um, very grounded from the sources. And again, that sense of responsibility. If this technology is covering uh, this particular language, then there should be something given back to them. So who owns that data at the end of the day? Will it be, you know, at the high end or is it is that ownership also felt at the ground? So I think that, that would be very, very critical in ensuring that, you know, this is very sustainable, even in terms of revising, because we know these models, language is not static. OK, what is the future of these models as language is changing? So that collaborative um, links with the sources of the data has to be sustainable. Um, well, the Edward's uh, points really make me think a lot about how we use language models. And we have a question here on how useful these new technologies are likely to be for people from our parts of the world, for like a better word. And what it makes me think is I find myself using GPTX in surprising ways that I didn't anticipate. And I found it hard to anticipate the way people have used it when I introduced it to them, um, which says a lot about our um, capacity to imagine um, what will be useful and what will be effective and meaningful for people. And without the lack of access, our probability of finding those applications and those useful tools that people will want to care about becomes difficult. And David, I wanted to, if you could comment on um, how we bridge that gap. So going from we have a language model or something, uh, an, an object to a tool that's uh, useful for people. You're muted, David. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, in terms of the usefulness, uh, it's a bit, it depends on the language model. So for example, if you talk about like ChatGPT and how useful it is for uh, for African languages, just like Monoji said in his talk, it's like we have not really made progress, right? Based on the large scale evaluation. It's like if you use smaller models, you can even get better result than prompting these large models. Uh, so which is a good thing, uh, and a bad thing. So a bad thing because we cannot benefit from these new approaches. A good thing because we can use smaller models to build uh, good tools that requires less com uh, compute and also gives better results. And this provides a lot of opportunity. So we could also have like smaller models behind APIs that makes it easy for developers to create tools. Uh, smaller models that are well tuned to African languages uh, that are more useful for business uh, uh, for business uh, tools. So I think this is uh, it, it's good for us. So we don't maybe we don't have to be distracted so much that okay my language is not working with ChatGPT at the moment, and just try to see what can we do with what already exists. Uh, I think that's a way to think about it. Uh, because I don't think it's um, a good way to to try to be competing with big tech companies at the moment. You cannot win the battle anyways. So, but what can you do with the valuable resources that are available? Uh, and as people are scaling, also it makes 
uh, smaller models more accessible to people. So initially, when Motivin Girl Birth came out, it was too big for people to run. But nowadays, it's really easy for, for you to run it on your computer and you can develop many applications. So if you have a, a small model like that, well tuned for your language, you can build very uh, important tools, maybe HP speed detection or uh, movie review uh, that can help maybe tourism in Tanzania or somewhere. Uh, I think this, we can think about the problem like that. Thank you. Um, before handing over to audience questions, I want to pick on Suniana again. And I know that getting these tools into the hands of people is something that you're passionate about in the team is. And the lack of access means limiting of innovation. Um, I wonder what your thoughts are on how we can um, take advantage and almost start that innovation. I think, uh, you know, we mentioned government regulations, but I think it's also up to the larger companies to have a broader definition of what inclusivity means, right? So language fairness is one thing, right? Making sure that these systems work for everyone, but also, you know, what about values, sociocultural uh, differences, you know, not everybody has the same values and may want their systems to be different. How do we incorporate those kinds of things better into these models uh, so that they can really work for um, everyone? So um, I think access issues, you know, will get sorted out eventually. I mean, based on the kinds of speculations Monojit was making. But even if people mm -hmm. have access, they may not be able to use these uh, models as well as others. And if these models are really going to change the world and, you know, everybody's going to use them, they're going to make everyone more productive, then there may be a few people who become even more productive. And those people may be in the global north for whom these models work really well, right? And Everybody else for whom these models don't work in their languages, don't align with their values and culture and things like that, it may just get worse. So I just see, I mean, I think that if we don't have regulation and, uh, you know, concrete action taken by the companies themselves to solve this, then this is digital divide is just going to get um, you know, larger and larger. So I think the time is now to take action and uh, really make sure that, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, this doesn't happen. I, I'm going to follow your charge. <laughs> um, thank you. Um, that's that's amazing, fantastically insightful. Um, I have a number of questions from the audience here, and the first one that I can see is Kalika's. It's in front of me, and Kalika asks: uh, Given that GPT-like LLMs are causing major disruptions in the field, um, what do the panelists think is the long-term research direction that we should be taking? Who would like to volunteer a contentious opinion? Something divisive and spicy. Okay, I can take a shot on it. Um, <laughs> I, I think uh, in the short run, again, uh, like what is happening right now, mm, uh, a lot of research can be done on understanding these models themselves. Like we really don't understand, uh, you know, what works, what doesn't work. You know what kind of questions they can answer is it from memorization or they are really reasoning you know do they really have com common sense or not what kind of moral or ethical values the models have if at all we can ascribe such values to a model so i think there are lots of these interesting questions that can be asked and uh, probed and one of the harder part uh, and of course language also like how it works in various languages for instance you know, a language like Hindi, these models uh, do work well. Uh, so GPT-4, uh, if you ask it a question in Hindi, Romanized Hindi, Devanagari script, it can answer pretty well. But it can't write good poetry in Hindi as good as it can write in English, for instance. So there are different proficiency levels of the model for different languages. So identifying those and all. So in the short run, I think, uh, that's an important set of questions that people should ask. The mm, other uh, set of research is what, you know, uh, Muhammad, you asked and uh, we, other panelists were responding to is applications. 
like they can really have a large number of uh, interesting applications. Uh, if you think of it, right, right now what's happening is you have a chat GPT, uh, sorry, GPT-4 plus Bing, and you have a Google Bard. What can you do? Go and do search. That's it. Uh, of course, you can get the search answers instantly, but there are so many other things we do in life other than searching. And uh, how much productivity does this new interface for search actually increase, uh, right? Uh, I'm not sure. So probably there are more interesting things that can be done there. And the uh, whole open area of research, I think, which uh, uh, will come up is uh, user experience plus NLP or language technology plus user experience because so far, I mean, we have done very little in this axis because technology was only mostly grammar editing or search engine or you know a little bit of um, uh, word correction etc so or, or speech recognition but now with this kind of you know a truly intelligent uh, interface uh, how are people going to use it uh, what works what doesn't work what uh, mm, what even a good experience means and stuff like that i'm sure there are a lot more I think so. I, I think you've also answered one of the questions that was posed, which is, right. Right. Um, is natural language understanding a good um, research area? Yes, it is. Um, please, Edward. Yeah, um, uh, that was a very interesting question, and I'm looking at it from the aspect of, you know, not just IT, but in higher education right now, you know, there's a lot of um, worrying, like, hey, what is the effect of uh, chat GPT? on uh, assessments, you know, as currently given, as conventionally given in higher education or education generally. Are students going to, you know, just type it in chat GPT and you have that answers and, you know, people will be scoring 100 in open, open book questions. So it's a big challenge looking at it from the educators. What kind of questions? How are we doing the assessments? in the light of these new technologies that students you know, have access to, and increasingly so. So changing how we evaluate, how we, you know, we assess learning, you know, uh, some time back when some of us were in school, were not allowed to use calculators. You needed to do the math by, you know, paper and pen. But today the students are allowed to use the calculators, meaning the questions, how the assessment is done has changed. And so it's very interesting to see the kind of research this is generating in terms of what is learning. Is it regurgitating yes. uh, the kind of assessments we're doing? Can we reach to higher levels of assessment, you know, uh, whereby students are able to really, you know, bring out more of, you know, combining ideas and trying to see uh, what is it that they can generate from the existing data rather than data that I can quickly you know, can be generated by chat uh, GPT. You know. yeah. I, I think it's fascinating that you say that um, as somebody who's spent um, more than a decade in um, uh, schools of you know, graduate and undergraduate schools and everything else. Today, when I see a hard coding problem that I need to think about, I go to GPT-4 and I say, give me an initial solution. Um, which which is interesting because now it's becoming a tool for me. Um, I remember seeing um, reading in the responsible AI reports for GPT-4, for example, the capacity to be able to solve senior um, level uh, engineering, senior software engineering level positions, um, questions in a few minutes, and the 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 the, the thing. That that took time was the researcher copying the question from one place to the input for GPT as opposed to the time that it took for the answer to come out. So clearly what learning and doing means changes, which impacts massively on our economies. Um, what are your thoughts? And I think Edward has certainly touched upon that, which is that we need to redefine these things and understand what, what learning means and what work means. I can happily pick on Kalika on this one as well, because I know that Kalika and Jackie have very strong opinions about this and they're on the on the call. But I think it's a very interesting point, um, 
how we interact with our world is changing um, because we suddenly have tools that have superpowers um, by our standards today, but we're not quite sure how to evaluate them and utilize them. Um, on that note, um, I think the last question that I will pose before we cut off is um, more um, technical. Um, I think it's from Clement, and he's asking, um, how much do we understand about the theoretical limits of LLMs? When will this phenomena change? We'd like to tackle that thorny subject. I don't think we understand much at all, right? right? As Monojit said, um, you know, we don't know why um, the systems behave the, the way they do and how to reliably um, change them in order to behave in a different way. So I think we're really at the very beginning of that journey. And um, I think it's important for us to um, figure that out and be able to communicate that also in a certain way to make these systems more explainable to, you know, all the people who are going to use them, especially the kind of people who aren't used to technology and who will probably get on to, you know, the first piece of technology they will ever use maybe an LLM, right? And how do we make sure that's that they scary. have the right mental model uh, to tackle that, right? So I think that's a very important yes. thing as well. Yeah. Um, I, I can go on for another hour, but in the interest of time, I want to say thank you very, very much to our panel. Um, this has been a, a fantastic and uh, thoughtful discussion uh, that I very, very much enjoyed. Thank you. Thank you. If anybody wants, thank you all. If anybody wants to give some closing remarks, please go for it. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very, very much, Mohammed, for facilitating the panel session. Uh, it was really great. It was quite uh, informative. Uh, thank you very, very much, all our panelists. And thank you, Monojit, for a wonderful keynote again. Uh, I'd like to thank you all for creating time and joining us in person. Um, yeah, and thank you, everybody, for staying on the call for like two hours. Uh, but I hope you all found this session uh, really, really useful. So like I mentioned, this is our first grand seminar. We do this every uh, quarter and we'll um, send you details of our next grand seminar soon. But monthly, we host uh, Mari monthly seminar series and we will update you with the details of our next seminar, which will be uh, next month. Uh, thank you very much. And we will share with you Monojit's uh, slides uh, about his talk on the keynote. So thank you, everybody, and have a wonderful evening. Thank you very much. Great to speak to you all.